If, uh, if I could ask y'all, would you, if I could promise you that I could guarantee you, if you had a couple of things in order between you and God, that you would have extra covering and sheltering during this time, would you be interested? Yes. Not hit and miss, guarantee. It's going to be a couple of things probably that you think that you know about, but I can almost promise you this morning that you don't, I'm going to teach you some things that you don't know. And hopefully, because I don't want to come and bring you the same old, same old. Okay. I don't want to go to church for 30 years and hear the same thing. I want, I want, God is, God is ever moving, ever growing. And, and he's, his, 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 he's a mystery that's ever able to, to go on adventures to seek out. So it's never the same, never the same. That's why it's called the gospel. Good news. The good news is something that you haven't heard for the last 30 years. It's something fresh. So got good news for y'all this morning. We'll, we'll, we may turn there in a little bit, but I will, I will, um, to kick this off, there's two things and I'm going to go and, and they're, and they're in prioritized. Number one is more important and carries more weight than number two. But let me give you the number two. And then I'll tell you where it comes from. Well, you know what? I'll tell you right now. It's in it's in Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And once I said that, a bunch of y'all that know the word are already going. You know, your your brain is already. But I can promise you, hold with me this morning because I'm because I I think I'm confident that we don't know everything that we think we know. Okay. So number two thing that will keep you. In a, in a right covering with God. The Bible says in Malachi 3, list two things. And the number two thing is watch your mouth. He said, I, he said you, you say, what good does it do to serve God? Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Nothing's working. Anybody been talking like that? This country's going to go down the tubes. And I don't know where God is, but it doesn't seem like he's doing anything. Even if we don't say that out of our mouths, if it's in our heart, he's hearing it. And God says, you talking bad about me. You're saying it doesn't do any good to follow the Lord, to, to follow his ordinances. And he says, you need to correct your mouth, correct your attitude. You can't correct your mouth without correcting your attitude. <laughs> Try it. I've tried it. I've sat in a car and fumed and said, when he gets in the truck, I'm not going to say a word. I'm going to be good. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. How long did it take me to blurt it all out? As soon as the door shut. Right. 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 Ladies. Yeah, I know. Men, too. So I'm just going to pick on the girls for right now. But anyway, the number one. So in Malachi chapter three, it's talking about our day right now, our time, because it talks about a this is this is prophetic, a prophetic time where God is coming closer to the planet Earth and he's going to retake control over his earth. Because he made it and it belongs to him. The earth and everything is, is, is the Lord's. But the thing is, he gave it in the very first books. He gave a 6,000 year lease over to mankind. And he said it because we know this because first Peter, I believe it is that says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. That is a prophetic key that lets us know the what unlocks the mysteries of God. So why did God create the heavens and the earth and everything in six days? Why not eight? Why not 10? Why not five? He could have done it in one. Why six? Because the Bible says in Isaiah 46, 10, I believe it is, that that says that God tells the end from the beginning. So in the very beginning, he says, I'm given 6,000 years, six days, he said, man shall labor. That wasn't just saying, that just wasn't saying something, giving you information. God never gives us worthless information. When he said six days man shall labor, he was saying for 6,000 years, I'm giving you the right and the ability to do what you want in the earth, to handle it the way you want. But he says the seventh day is what? It's the Lord's. He said seventh day is my day. It's the Lord's day. Now we got it all screwed up and we started fighting over whether it's Saturday or Sunday. And we think that if we sit down in the living room for 48 hours that we're we're doing the Lord's deal and all of that. And got any, I don't think it's got that much to do with that. Matter of fact, I, I wondered and I've said this here before, but this I got to lay this foundation. That uh, 
uh, you know, when you go through the Ten Commandments, I often wonder, I mean, when it's dealing with all the really bad stuff like murder and adultery and thieving and stuff, it says thou shalt not. <laughs> Goes on to the next one. Thou shalt not. Don't kill nobody. Don't steal nobody's woman. Don't. And, but then when it gets to the Sabbath. He goes, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And when you really go into the other scriptures that describes it, it says, and if you do any work, you're going to get stoned. And if your servants do work, they're to get stoned. And if your donkey works, he's to get, I'm going, dear God, what's the deal with the Sabbath, man? It just skipped over murder. And it's going, stone them suckers for messing with the Sabbath. You know, either God is a religious freak which we know he's not. Only mankind gets to be religious freaks. But God is not a religious freak. So what in the world did he mean? What he's saying, God is a God of love, right? He is love. He doesn't have love. He is it. That means he can't be anything but love. All right? You can't tame a rattlesnake because it is what it is. And you can't change what it is. You can't tame it. So God doesn't have to be tamed. He is love. So what was he saying for 6,000 years? I'm going to give, I'm going to take my, I'm going to back off and I'm not going to invade man's deals unless he opens the door and asks me for it. And he, and he invites me to come along and co-labor with him. Otherwise I keep my hands off. But he said on the seventh day, he said, if you're trying to do your stuff on the seventh day and it's outside of my stuff, it'll get you killed. That's basically what he's saying. When the seventh day gets here, you piddle fart around out there in the world. You, you get killed. Now, we're living in the seventh day. We're just now in the beginnings of the seventh day. How do I know? Because from Adam and Eve to uh, Abraham was 2,000 two years, two days. From Abraham to Jesus was another 2,000 years. God does something spectacular, seems like, every two days. And from Jesus to us is how many? Approximately 2,000 years. Our calendars are all off, but we're we're there, right? So we are entering in to the beginnings of the seventh day. This is not a day that we do our own thing and ask God to just bless it and come along and do my thing. He's been putting up with a lot of Ananias and Sapphira stuff. But there's coming a time to where he won't do that anymore. Now, I'm not so worried about God. What I want is covering from the stuff going on out there. All right. So how in the world? So in Malachi, he talks about that he's coming. Well, how do we know when that is? Because it's when it's beginning to be his day. When he has the right, because he's already said it on the seventh day. It's my day. Seventh day, I'm, I'm coming back to visit what is mine. And so it says in Malachi chapter three, he said, uh, behold, verse one, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Didn't say for. See, people have got their mind on getting snatched out of here. And that's not God's mind. God's mind is to bring heaven to earth. Now, there is a catching away. But he's not going to catch us away because we're getting our brains beat out by the devil. God is not pulling us out of here. He's not He's not going to grab a bunch of cowards and snatch you out of here because the devil's heat's getting pretty hot and you're losing. God don't work that way. He's never failed. And he's going to have a people who don't fail. All right? So it didn't say coming for his temple. It said it's coming what? Two. Two. Who's the temple? This building? Is this building the temple? Is the buildings down yonder with the steeples? Is that the temple? Tell me. We are, right? I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's coming to his temple. And it goes, then it goes on to say, oh my God, but who can abide his coming? Who, who can stand when God, pure holiness and fire and awesomeness comes in our midst? What's going to cloak us from, from this? And it says he, and why is he coming? He's coming because, and it says in verse two, um, no, uh, he will be a refiner's fire. Uh, verse three, he said he's going to be a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi. In other words, his own. He's going to purify his own. All right. I want to be purified. Don't you? I do. I want the garbage that runs in the back of my computer back here. I want that stuff out. I don't, I don't want to have to fight to be good. I just want to be all me and all good. 
and all. So he's coming to purify us. The people of God that are asking him to purify them, purify yourself. It's, it's a good thing. And it may hurt to find some of this stuff out or get things corrected, but it's sure better than the, than the other. But then after that, I mean, along with that, he's also coming to do justice in the earth and he's going to deal with wickedness. How many of y'all would like some wickedness dealt with? Uh-huh. We have had it put under the rug. We've had the bad guys paid off and go their way. It's two different systems, two different legal systems. One for, for, the, for the elite that owns all the banking money and the rest of us. Right? And, uh, I mean, there's so many people that's got raw deals that the government has not stood by because they're padding their own pocket. Politicians padding their own pocket, judges taking bribes, everybody, they're corrupt, 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 right? And I'm tired of it, and y'all are too. And I want God to do some correcting. But let me tell you this, when God comes to do correcting, who's he going to correct first? (laughs) So come on, Jesus. I want to be an open book. Correct me. So that when you come and bring justice back in the earth, because why? Because the Bible says that the foundation of the Lord is uh, righteousness and it ain't truth and righteousness. It's righteousness and justice. Righteousness and justice is the foundation of his throne. So as he comes to the earth, the earth has to be able to hold him. And it's going to take righteousness and justice to hold the foundation that not cor- break under the weight, weightiness of God coming close. So he has to bring justice. People say, people, when people say to me, well, there'll never be any justice. I, I know where they're from. They're only talking about past experiences and past histories. They know nothing about the word of God and they're not taking God at his word because he says, I'm going to bring justice. I want it. You want it, Right. Okay, so when he does, and it says he's going to come near to you in judgment, verse 5, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against false swears, against those who oppress the hireling in his wages. Man, that's going on a lot where people don't get paid. They get cheated out of their way either by by somebody that's a snake in the grass or a corporation that has you to work 35 years, but before you get your your retirement, they sell out and bankrupt and you've lost everything. That It ain't happened to none of us in here possibly. I mean, I don't think. But the thing is, it's happened to a lot, hasn't it? Yeah. Or manipulate the market and then take your take your retirement from you or whatever. Okay, let get off of that. Um, but I need to bring it into this day and this hour. This is not something that is either far off in the future, nor is it something that's in the past. This is where we are. Okay. And he says, um, verse six, for I am the Lord and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even uh, I'm going to. Well, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and you have not kept them. Return unto me, the Lord says, and I'll return unto you. Get it right. Turn and, and do what is in your hands to get it right. And I will I will be able to because they said, how can we stand? They said uh, and they said, well, we're in how how, we're in. Shall we return? First, they said, how can we stand before you? He says, return unto me and I'll return to you. Well, how in the world will we return? He said, quit stealing from me. Quit robbing God. Quit being a thief. And they said, well, wait a minute, God, you know, um, if verse if verse eight says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein if we robbed you in tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation, I can hear the minds of some people ticking already on whether it's in Facebook or in this room or both. Well, this tithing is old covenant, old covenant. No, it's not. No, it's not. I'll show you scriptures in the new covenant. Besides that tithing, they say tithing is part of the law. It never was part of the law. Tithing was instigated in the garden, before the garden. And the law didn't come in for like 430. Well, even when uh, Abraham tithed to uh, Melchizedek was 430 some odd years before the law ever existed. So before the law was even a thing, there was tithing and it was set up by God. What is set up before the law? Let me ask you this. 
loving your neighbor is in the Old Testament. Is God done with that? Do you throw loving your neighbor away? Hmm? Well, what about committing adultery? You ain't supposed to commit adultery. But that's that's Old Testament. So we don't have to do worry about that no more. We can run around like a alley cat. Is that right? Is it right? No, no, it's not right. So why in the world would you throw out one thing that says, well, because it tells us about that in the Old Testament, that doesn't exist for us today. I'll tell you why. Because you're greedy. <laughs> Let's just cut through the fat, y'all. Because you're greedy. Because you're scared that if you turn loose of that $2.50, you ain't going to have everything you want. And God is saying, trust me. Trust me. Put your money where your mouth is. You know, it's like I heard somebody say, I can look at your checkbook and tell you what pri what's priorities in your life. And, uh, and it, sure enough, it does. Our, our bank account tells us. Well, anyway, let me go on down. And, they, and he says, for you, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me this whole nation. Bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Now, let me say this again. I've heard people say, well, it's got to come into the church. It should come to the local church if that's where you're getting fed. But it just said, bring it into the house. The same people that says it's got to come to the local church. It's got to come to this, to this organization, to this ministry, whatever. Same people said that will say, who is the house of the Lord? Is it this building? Who is the house? Come on, don't be afraid. We are. So in other words, it don't mean you just give it to people, but it says that there may be meat in my house. You give it to places where the food is coming out. You give it where you're fed. You give it where it's alive. You don't put it into some dead organization and say, I've tithed because that if you stick money in a coffin, it ain't going nowhere. It's just going into a dead work, y'all. So anyway, um, go, uh, so he goes on down and he says, uh, he says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, says the Lord, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven, I'll make porters, portals to pour you out blessings, to pour you out a blessing and there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Who's the devourer? Satan in any way and shape and form, whether he comes to the IRS or a thief sneaking around your back door. All right. Don't matter how it comes. He's he's the instigator behind it. All right. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground and neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field and, and all nations will call you blessed and you'll be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now, all right, now I get to get to the good stuff, okay? I'm, I'm, I am so pumped, I'm so pumped about this. Um, in, uh, I'm going to turn, if you want to, and if you're writing notes, please write this down. Exodus chapter 13, the 13th chapter of Exodus. Verse one, and the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, specify, specify, sanctify. <laughs> okay, I saw the big S and it just sanctify <laughs> unto me, the firstborn, whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and of beast, it is mine. Sanctify me, the firstborn. Okay, let's turn over here to verse um, 12. That thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that opens the matrix or the womb and every firstling that comes of a beast, which you have, the males shall be the Lord's and every firstling of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you will break its neck and all the firstborn of man among your children shall you redeem. OK, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> all of this makes sense. God doesn't say anything that is concealed in a time capsule that now we've grown out of and it has no bearing on us. What he says something, it's it'll go to the end of the ages. All right. So what is he saying? He's given us. He said the first the first fruits are mine. Tithing. If you're tithing at the end of your paycheck, you're not tithing because it has to be first fruits. Because it doesn't take any faith to once I find out I got enough money, then I can give God this. That's no faith. And he says, I want the first of everything. Why? Because God's uh, uh, corrupt or greedy? No. 
No, because the Bible goes on. I, I, I don't want to turn there right now and mix it, but it talks about that the tithe is holy unto the Lord. It, it's holy. So if it if what is holy comes back to him, then he can bless the all, the whole entire thing. But if you don't let what's holy go to him, then there's a curse on the entire thing. And God wants to bless every penny that's in your bank account and in your wallet. So to get that done, you give him the first, the very first, because the first is holy, not the second, not the third, not the last. The first, if I had, if I had 10 $1 bills out here, which one is God's? The first one that's going to go anywhere. That's not to go to the electric company. That's not to go to the feed cattle. The first one is God's. Then he blesses all of the rest. Okay, now, so get, why, why does he say uh, you've got to redeem the donkey with a lamb or you break its neck? Well, because clean and unclean. This is going to be, this is so cool. Donkeys are an unclean beast. Sheep, for whatever reason, I like, personally, I like goats better than sheep. Maybe it's because my attitude and character more aligns with goats than it does with sheep <laughs> right if you have 50 goats and one gets out how many is left in your pasture zero right right they're leaders and anyway <laughs> then I, I digress okay you got clean animals you got unclean animals so a donkey is unclean so it has to be redeemed a lamb, a firstborn of a lamb, is clean, so it has to be what? Sacrificed. All right. Jesus was God's firstborn. The Bible says it. He's, got, he's the firstborn, and he was the firstborn from the dead, right? But he was God's firstborn. Is he clean or unclean? Clean. Talk to me. Clean. 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 So what, had, what, had, what did he have to do? Sacrifice. Be sacrificed. Now, all of us, whether we're the firstborn or not, are we clean or unclean when we're, when we're born? I mean, unclean. Yeah. So we have to be redeemed. The unclean has to be redeemed. The clean has to be sacrificed. So God got his firstborn into the earth. In other words, God gave the tithe first. He gave the tithe. He gave his only begotten son. So that he could win the whole world, so that he could bless the whole. Because if he didn't give the first, the whole wouldn't be blessed. You and I would be doomed for hell. I'm telling you, this tithe is way more powerful than we realize. So Jesus was the clean. He had to be sacrificed. And we're the unclean. We have to be redeemed. Jesus is God's tithe. God gave Jesus in faith that he given the most precious thing that ever put footprints on this earth. He gave the most precious in faith, believing that it would bring him a crop of people and he would make them like his firstborn. Is that pretty cool? Now let's, let's go, let's go to some other things. This is so uh, Jesus is God's tithe. God gave Jesus first. God has to be first, okay? In, and I'm not going to turn there, but in Exodus 4, 22, you can write it down. Uh, is God spoke and said that Israel is my firstborn. We're going to see why history kind of happened the way it did. He said, he said, Israel is my firstborn. Numbers 3, 13, chapter 3 in Numbers verse 13 says, all the firstborn are mine. All the firstborn are mine, God says. All right? And then he says, Israel is the firstborn. So all of Israel is what? It's God. It's the firstborn. So therefore, when God sent um, Moses uh, to go talk to Pharaoh, where did I, where did I, I, I got to, where I wrote that down somewhere. Um, where, well, hopefully I can find it. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to look up Exodus 13. No, it's not there. I should have marked it in my Bible, but I, I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, I might find it here in a, bit, in, a, in a bit. But when God spoke to Moses and sent him to, to Pharaoh, right? 
what did what was the message he said let my people go why because they're the tithe then he says right off the bat I, I, i've got it written somewhere but now i don't know where i wrote it um so right off the bat oh maybe i don't know Ex, let me try exodus 29 because i'd like to read it i'd like i'd like to read it if i can find it i would sure like to have the help in finding it nope that's not it okay so he says let my people go and he said in one place that I'm trying to figure out where I wrote it down he said told Moses to say if you don't let my people go they're my firstborn and maybe maybe that is uh, Exodus 4 I'll try that I, I'm hung up here I really really want to read that and not uh, yes, it is. Praise God. Exodus 4, verse 22. God says, and you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So what is Israel to him? It's a tithe, isn't it? Uh-huh. And he says, and I say unto you, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, I will slay all your sons, even your firstborn. Why did God, is God a murderer? No. Why did he have a legal right to kill all of Egypt's firstborn sons? Because they digressed the tithe and would not bend. And so God in his goodness keeps giving warning after warning. So what did they do? Ten plagues, right? Ten plagues. Nine before he took their sons. He gave them lots of time to go. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious about this. You know, you turn the water into blood, you're eat up with flies, all your cattle dies. There's darkness so dark that they said they can't even go out of their building and all this and that. And he's proving every single day, I'm God, and you need to let my son go or your sons are going to die. Yep, yep, he's God, he's God, yep. We're Egypt, we got, we got powerful gods. Okay, did you know that all those plagues addressed Egypt's gods? They thought that Ra was the sun god. So he said, oh, you want to worship the sun? Let's just keep it dark for 24 hours. They worship the water. You want to worship the water? Let's just turn it into dead blood. You, they worship frogs. What in the world you'd want to worship a frog for? But they worship frogs. He said, you like frogs? Well, we'll give you frogs. And it says they were in their ovens and they were in bed with them and everything. They worshiped lice. So he gave them plagues of lies. He said, you think your gods are more powerful than me? I said, you know, let's have a taste of what you like. You like that? We'll give you. It's like, you know, it's like some of the parents that said, get their kids, catch them smoking out behind the barn. You want to smoke? You like smoke? Here, you're going to sit here and smoke a whole pack or more until you're puking, you know? Whatever. I'll give you what you want till you don't want it. Anyway, that don't work all the time, so don't do that always. Right. <laughs> I mean, I did it with watermelon. I ate watermelon, so I loved watermelon until I puked up watermelon when I was a kid. And now I can eat it, but I don't really like it. So I thought I'd try to do the same thing with chocolate. It ain't worked. <laughs> if I could just quit liking chocolate or ice cream. Okay. All right. So he takes their firstborn. Why did he do that? He had the right to do it. They wouldn't let his go. So I'll take yours. If you want to hold what is God's from him, you're taking the chance. I mean, he's such a merciful God. You're getting, you and I are getting away with a ton of stuff. But as God gets closer, are we going to be so freelanced? Do you want covered in this world or not? Now, you can do it for the reason of covering yourself in this world, but what it really needs to turn into is love. You do it because I love you, Lord. But he'll take you any way you can go. He'll bait the hook. You take it. You'll fall in love. You stay hooked up. You'll fall in love. So anyway, uh, what about what about um, uh, Joshua and Jericho? It's another tithe. When when God sent His children. Oh, and you know. And by the way, have you ever noticed this? This is going to be off the subject just a little bit. But have you ever noticed that Moses only asked for three days? Just let us go three days and worship the Lord, and we'll come back. But they didn't come back. Why didn't they come back? 
because Pharaoh broke, broke his word again. He, was, he made the agreement to let him go for three days. And then in the middle of that agreement, he broke and he went to chase him to bring him back. And God goes, gotcha, sucker, because God lays traps and he lets us walk into them. And when Pharaoh ran his army and Pharaoh himself was with that army and they ran that army into the sea that was split. I love the word of God. And it says, and the angels were ter taking the, the, the chariot wheels were falling off their chariots, you know, and they said, hark, I think God fights for them. Man, y'all are slow. <laughs> y'all are dull. Not y'all, not, not them. I mean, if you go through 10 plagues and then you see a God split open a Red Sea and they walk across on dry ground and then you're going to go after them, you're dumber than a bucket of rocks. Right. And when the chariot wheels are coming off and it says, and they drove heavily, <laughs> I reckon <sighs> they need my horse to pull that one. <laughs> I mean, you're talking, you're, you're, you're making arena ground there, <sighs> you know, and they drove, he they drove heavily and it says, huh, I think God's fighting for them. Boy, ain't that right? Sherlock. Well, I'm glad you got that one figured out. Little late, you fixing to die. <laughs> right? Pharaoh died that day. That's why the children of Israel didn't have to return after three days. Why? Because Pharaoh owned them. Check back the word. He owned everybody. He owned the people. He owned the land. When he died, they were free. And God set it up to free them. Said, we'll bring them back in three days, knowing that he would not keep his word. And so when he died, they're free. So first city that they finally get to out of the wilderness, you know, Jericho. God gives them the information. He says, tells them what to do, march around that city, you know, once a day for seven days and all that. The walls are going to come crumbling down and you can walk right straight in. But he said, this is a very rich city, very wealthy, very powerful city, the, the most powerful ever that they're ever going to face. He sends this unexperienced army to the most fortified city out there. God does that a lot. He sends you to some place where you go, I can't do this. He goes, I know. That's why I'm sending you here because you're going to have to depend on me. So he gives you, did you know my son, my son went to West Point. He graduated West Point. He said they stu at West Point, you study all of the historic armies uh, and uh, wars. You study all the historic wars, except for those that are Israel's, <laughs> not because they're anti-Semitic. <laughs> he said, because Israel's wars don't make any sense. You can't use Israel's strategy as a strategy. That was God's strategy. You can't march around a city seven times and blow a trumpet and that thing fall, to, fall flat, right? <laughs> you can't send the worshipers out there in front and win this battle. They're going to get slaughtered, <laughs> right? Unless you hate your worshipers. Go on out there. We'll see if God will do it two times in a row. All right. Um, <laughs> you know, so they study all of the wars except for Israel's because you can't. Israel's don't make any sense. They're not a man's strategy that you can duplicate. It's a God's strategy. So God tells them, when he says, when you take Jericho, do not take any of the riches. Don't take any of the wealth. Don't, don't grab one piece of gold, not one coin, not one. It's very rich city. Why is God doing that? Because he's, he's tight? No, because it's the, come on, talk to me. The tithe, y'all. It's the first. It's the first of their increase. They're fixing to take all the land. They're fixing to get houses they didn't build, wells they didn't dig, crops that they didn't plant, cattle that they didn't grow. They're fixing to get it all. This is the first bit. This is the, talk to me, tithe. He says, don't touch it. And he said this. He said, it's holy. Everything in there is holy. Well, you know, that was the most demonized city. That wasn't holy stuff. It wasn't dedicated to the Lord. Well, why did God say that? Because it's the first of the increase that he's given his people. So it needs to come back to him and then it will be holy. And then everything else they get after that will be 
holy and God wants his people blessed financially, health wise, every other way. So he says, don't take anything of this city because it's mine. Well, we know by reading the book that one guy, one guy out of all the thousands, one guy, Aiken, <laughs> I can see his name. That's why he was Aiken, y'all. He messed up. So he is Aiken. He takes some gold and a bunch of some nice clothes, you know, that come out of the cute boutiques, and, and he buried them in his, in his uh, tent. And so the next city that they were to take was a little podunk deal. I mean, it's, you know, it's like Eden, Texas, you know. It's already defeated. <laughs> um, Lord, if you're from Eden, I'm sorry. Forgive me. It just kind of come up in my mind. Okay. Um, anyway, ooh, it just bubbled up. I didn't really mean it. It was just the one I came to. Um, anyway, it was AI. And, and it's a little bitty nothing town. They, they just send a few thousand guys out to take it, and they get defeated. A bunch of the guys gets killed. And AI sends them running. And, and, and Joshua goes before the Lord, what are you doing, Lord? Why have you deserted us? And God says, quit whining at me. Go and find out who took the tithe. And they found out who it did it. And man, that's the weirdest thing ever. If you want to get entertained, read the word. Man, that's weird. I mean, the ground opens up and swallows this man and his whole family. You talk about creepy. That's creepy. <laughs> What is God saying there? He's saying, if you hold from me the tithe, every, it seems like the world out there is going to eat everything up that you got. Your truck will start malfunctioning. That's this and that and the other. The ground will swallow you up. This earth is not your friend unless you've got the presence of God on you and it will eat your lunch. You need the tithe to be right with God. And they repented, and after that they had no problems, and they was able, read it, they was able to keep all the wealth from all the other cities. The tithe is more than just put your little penance in the, let me tell you some stories now. I was in, I was in Georgia for an entire month working on two albums a long time ago. It's been several wow. years now, shamefully, because it's the last time I've done albums. And uh, I was out there for an entire month, had my horse with me, living in my horse trailer and working on two albums. And um, and so uh, when I left to come back into Texas, where I was, they were my friends. Uh, David Huff, awesome, awesome, brilliant musician and all that and loves Jesus. All I had to do was tell David and Twyla that all I had was a twenty dollar bill to go back to Texas with a one ton dually pulling a big horse trailer and a horse that weighs 1,600 pounds in it. Doesn't take no rocket scientist to figure out that tank of gas ain't going to get me home. And, uh, I, but I, I wasn't about to tell, tell them. And I was, I was thinking, I'm like, I'm a tither, Lord. I'm a tither. You'll get me home. Well, I'm driving I-10. And, oh, and I had all the credit, I, I had one credit card that was still not maxed out, and it was the Murphy card. So I can get diesel if I can find a Murphy that has diesel. They don't all have diesel. And, uh, and I, I don't know how many times the, the, the gas, what do you call the little gas pump on your dash was lit up, and the next thing you know, it's dinging. You're about out of fuel. And when you run out of fuel in a diesel, that ain't a fun thing. And I'm pulling this huge trailer and all of this. And I'd just be right on the, I mean, like, God, God, I need a Murphy. Show up with diesel and all of that. And, uh, and man, there'd be one show up. And I'd pull in. I swear I had to be on fumes. Pull in. And I'm like, I'm like having a problem with this. I'm like, Lord, I'm a tither. I'm a tither. What in the world going? I was on the verge of tears. I, I got to go through so many states. Two, it's a two-day trip. And uh, I'm a tither. And the Lord started speaking to me. And he said, you're not a tither. And you know how us women are. We're at, well, one like me. I'm like, yes, I am. You know, you're going to argue with God. You are a dipstick. All right. God. 
But anyway, you know, it just comes up. Well, yes, God, I am a tither. He said, no, you're not. It's on to me. He said, tithe is to honor me. And he said, oh, yeah, you paid the first tenth, but you just ha you just have your secretary slap it in an envelope, and lick it, and put a stamp on it and send it off. Just like paying the electric bill. He said, you're not honoring me with the tithe. You're to honor me with the tithe. You're not honoring me. You're just acting like you're paying a utility bill. Oh, that got me. That was the truth. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I repented. God got me home on Murphy stations. Praise God. And I got home and I told my youngest son, because I, I had another deal in Wyoming. My credit cards are maxed out and there's no money in the office. And I called, I told Colt Wrangler, I, he had some money. He said, Mama, I can give you $800. All right, you get me out there. And uh, so I, I took my son's $800 and I went to this cowboy church out in the sparse place in Montana. And they had me to come and do a Wednesday night deal. So I wasn't expecting a whole lot, you know. And pastor didn't do any big deal about it. He got, well, I got all done and he just stuck a bucket up there and he said, hey, if you want to give to her, Put it, put it in there. That's it. That's it. And so he emptied it all out and handed it to me. I went back to the trailer, and uh, and I mean I spent most of the eight hundred dollars to get out there. And I got up on the, dumped it out on the bed, and I cried. It was eight thousand dollars in that bucket. Eight thousand dollars when I got it right. When I got it right with God, God got it right for me. Let me tell you some more. Okay. Is this okay? I, I'm, I'm watching the clock. So I'm like to get you out of here before noon. Uh, we were rodeoing Ray and I, and it was before our oldest son was born. And Ray was a really good bull rider. And uh, we were living at Branson, Missouri. I was working two jobs. Ray was working two jobs. I was pregnant with Tiger and I'd get, I'd work one, I'd work one, uh, shift in waitressing and then walk down several blocks to another restaurant and work a second shift. We were really working hard to try to, well, we wanted a rodeo. I mean, that's, that's what, this was just to support our rodeo habit. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we just eat beans and taters and no joke, you know, beans and cornbread, just let us rodeo. And in the PRCA, you know, you got to enter way in advance. And he'd pick out his rodeos and we'd enter them, call in and enter them. And it never failed. When it came time to go to those rodeos, we either had enough money to pay our rent or we could take the rent money and make the rodeo. Either way, if you don't make the rodeo, you're going to pay a, a fine at the PRCA and it keeps adding up. So heck, you go because it made sense to us. It was like, shoot, let's take this money and go to the rodeo because you, he's a good rider. And then we'll have more money because we barely got enough money anyway. So this will make us some more money. Every single time we did that, he'd fall off like a fat woman every time. <laughs> it was like he couldn't ride a sick pussycat. We would go up several states because we was rodeoing in the Great Lakes because that's where we started. So we're having to drive all the way up to Wisconsin and places like that and hit these rodeos. And, and that's you fall off that far away and that's expensive. And no. Uh, and so I'm like, I'm like, we was we didn't know what we said. God, we're tithers. We're tithers. We were tithing. God got his first. And I'm like, why aren't you blessing us? And I mean, we had we we had we were behind on our rent. We were behind. They were about to cut off our electric. I mean, is lean days, you know, you know, a bunch of you've been there. And I'm like, God, what in the world is going on? We're tithers. And your word says, you know, you bring it to God like you're the one that knows what's going on. Your word says, blah, blah, blah. You're going to take care of us. And I happened to turn while I was seeking God and I was looking at, at, um, at uh, looking through the word and asking God, OK, what's going on? What's going on? I happened on to Luke chapter 16. And it says this because money, God is more is interested in money, not just his money. You give him his money and you don't act right to other people and your finances will still get held up. Listen to this. Uh, verse 10, uh, Luke 16, uh, verse 10. 
He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. God is saying, if you're going to cheat in a little area, I can't trust you with a bunch because you'll cheat there too. You say, well, it's just, you know, it's just a piece of bubble gum I, I nicked. Well, if you're going to take a piece of bubble gum, you'll steal a cow. So, you know, if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you're not going to be faithful with money, he said, how, are you, how, how can I commit to you the true riches? I want more than money. You can have a billion dollars in the bank, but if you're dying of cancer, it ain't doing you a bit of good. Money don't do you no good. I need more than money. I want his covering. I want his health. I want his blessings. If, if you got a billion dollars, but your kids won't talk to you, that's no good. Right? And so we need more. Than, it's, more it's more than money. We need the blessing of God all the way around. And he says, um, if you have not been faithful in that which is, uh, uh, well, let me read 11 again. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon or money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? When I read that, I went, oh, my gosh. We were trying to rodeo on rent money, on the electric corpor corporation money, on money that we owed other people. That was the date we owed it. And we would take that money and instead of paying them, we'd go and, and rodeo off of it. And it was, and God says, then who can give you your own? He had to withhold our blessing because we were withholding someone else's legal money that we owed them. We weren't being honest. We didn't know we weren't. We is cowboy mentality. OK, we didn't know we were being dishonest, that we were just thinking like cowboys. Let's get to the next rodeo. It'll all work out. Right. And it, and it says no servant can serve two masters for either you will hate the one and love the other or else you will hold to one and you will despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You have to decide right now. Do you love your money more than you love God? Put your money where your mouth is. If you're withholding the first tenth, you love your money. You trust in your bank account more than you trust God. There is no way to dodge that ball. That ball is going to ring true. So when we, when, when we saw that, I remember Ray was fishing. He was fishing because we needed to eat. And, and he was you know, it was down there in one of their lakes where they had trout and he was fishing for trout so that we'd have some meat to eat. And I ran down there and showed him this and both of us saw it. And we was like, God, forgive us. God, forgive us. And so we we put ourselves on a budget, and worked hard. It took we figured we'd be several months out, you know, being able, before we could go to another rodeo. That is really hard when all your friends are rodeoing and you're just going to a dadgum job. That's really hard. And uh, it's like pulling teeth. Anyway, uh, so we stayed home and we caught up. We caught up and it was so cool. God did something cool for us. And just before in time to enter on the 4th of July, Cowboy Christmas, we had the money. And we, we entered three rodeos up north, all in Wisconsin and around that area. And Ray, Ray didn't even go to the practice pen because it cost five dollars to get on a bull. We couldn't we didn't we didn't spend nothing. And we caught up people's bills. Well, our bill to people. All right. For six, eight weeks, I believe it's about eight weeks. He never practiced. He'd sit on the on the arm of the couch and he would practice in his mind. And that's all he did. We entered three rodeos. We go up there. He won. Two out of the three. We come home rich, 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 rich. <laughs> and never been on a bull in two months. And he was riding everything they ran in there. Why? Because God says, now I can bless you. Because you're not withholding from another man. Now I can give you what I wanted to give you. One more story. Is it all right? Is it making sense to y'all? Good. Cool. Okay. So we learned that really hard. Well, 
a couple years later, we were living in Trinity, Texas. We drove through Trinity, Texas one night on a rainy night, and I had made the mistake of saying, oh, God, I would never want to live in this depressed town. And that's exactly where God sent us. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we, we drove from Arkansas. We had 20 acres and a little house with peach trees and a, and a garden, and you could see Bull Shoals Lake from our house, $75 a month rent. And we left that to go to Trinity, Texas. And, and we, all we had was a 64 Chevy and a flatbed truck. And I had, Ray was already down there working and I had everything stacked up in there. And you know how you do, you put your mattresses on top and all the way from Arkansas to Texas, we was losing cotton out of those mattresses, you know. <laughs> and it, it looked like the Beverly Hillbillies coming to town, y'all. And, uh, and I, I pulled the truck around the back side of the church there, the risen sun, because I, I knew I didn't need to embarrass anybody. We got in there in the night. I, I found a piece of sheet of plywood, and I put it on the ground, pulled one of the mattresses off, and I knew nothing about fire ants. And me and Tiger slept on that mattress on that piece of plywood. He woke up. That child was so tired. He slept through the night, and those fire ants, he looked like he had measles the next morning. His face was all, and from that day on, they still call that boy fire ant. And no. Uh, Anyway, we started out like that. We started out like that. And uh, I, I'm not riding bulls or broncs anymore because obviously I've had a kid. Kind of puts the quietus on that stuff. And um, But every time that Ray'd go to the practice pen, you know, I'd pick out, you know, a good jump kicker just to get a thrill. You know, I, I was, kept getting on bulls and I kept getting on easy broncs, you know, just the easy stuff, just to stay kind of in shape. And all of a sudden, got a call one day, and they said the all-girl finals was coming up at the Lazy E Arena, and uh, <laughs> there'd been a rodeo, an all-girl rodeo, and they, <laughs> some brainy, <laughs> brought in survey stock, <laughs> yeah, for the girls, killed a bunch of them off, man. It was like girls that had broken arms and this and that and the other. And they called me and they said, it ain't funny. I'm laughing. But after the fact, it wasn't funny. <laughs> what a dumb deal. Bring in survey stock for the girls. Anyway, they killed a bunch of girls off. And they're fixing to have the all-girl finals at the Lazy Arena. And ESPN2 is wanting to film it. And there ain't enough girls to ride rough stock. And because they're all getting over broken bones. So they called me up and they said, Look, we got this deal. We're in we're in bad need here. We will we will pay all your entry fees, put you up in a hotel. You obviously can't win any year end deal, but anything you win at this thing is yours. No expenses, just getting here. I mean, Mama didn't raise no fool. I'm like, uh, yeah, hello, sign me up. And so what happened was right when it come time where I was gonna have to leave in the next couple of days. Guess what? When we looked at our deal, we had just enough. Our rent was $125. We had enough to pay rent and some other things, you know, but no money left over for me to, for fuel and stuff to get there and all of that. And, I ain't, and, and I'm like, well, he's, you know, that, it wasn't even an option. Well, take that rent money. You'll ride good. You'll make some money. Come back. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. So this is what I did. I took my Bible to the land, landlord's house, and it's a lady, she owned a lot of houses and places, they were very wealthy, and knocked on her door, and I had my Bible, and she invited me into the kitchen table, and I set my Bible down, I turned to Luke chapter 16, and I told her the deal, I said, I got this opportunity to go to this all-girl rodeo finals, and I said, I can enter in both, and I got a lot of chances to bring home some money, problem is, all I got to go on is your rent money, and I said, I'm, you know, and I could go and buck off of everything and and I come back and we owe you rent and we'll catch it up. We'll catch it up, but we won't have it on time. And she leaned back in her chair and says, I have never seen this happen before. <laughs> or somebody come in and tell me that. And she said, you can go and take. I, I made sure I said, I can take your rent money and go to this rodeo. Yes. I have your blessing. I'm scared, man. I knew what this would do to us. If I have your blessing. Yes, you have my blessing. Yes. So I go to this deal. Well, I bucked off every bull I got on, but I'm, I'm winning money on every bronc. 
and I, I was really cranking on up there in the Bronx. And uh, so I found out that the short go, it just happened to set on a Sunday, or excuse me, it was a Saturday, but I had to leave that Saturday to come all the way back to East Texas to make it to a little gathering that I promised somebody that I would be there to use the guitar for them to minister to some of these kids. It's just going to be a little podunk deal. And I'd given my word I would be there. And to do that, I had to pull out of the short go. Well, I've already got four or $500 won. And if I just cover one more bronc, I can, about, I can double that and have average money and all. And it was going to make me a lot more money in. Man, it was like pulling teeth. I guarantee you I did not want to leave. I wanted to get on that one more bronc so bad. And I almost did it. I almost just wanted to call him up. Ah, you know, man, you'll understand. I'm out here, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't do it. I am so glad I didn't. But I tell you what, I didn't have the greatest of attitudes. I left there looking at that check that I won, thinking, man, I could have doubled that. And we need the money and blah, blah, blah. I get back to Texas the next morning. You know, I go and do this deal. And it's, it was cool. There was some kids got saved and all that. And this cow man, he, he used to ride bulls too. Uh, you know, some of y'all might know if I told his name. But anyway, he came up to me afterwards and he said, my wife and I, we just sold a whole trailer load of cattle. And he said, I don't know why that God put it on our heart to give you the tithe. He handed me a check for twelve hundred and fifty some odd dollars. And I cried because he had no idea what was my ordeal. Y'all, this is I'm closing out on this is the thing is, is you can't outdo God. You can't out honest God. You can't be so honest that he can't keep up with you. <laughs> Trust me, you're never going to get you're never going to be more honest and more integritable than God. Now, I'll tell you something else. He don't pay up every Saturday night, neither. You might be integritable about something for 10, 15 years. And then God pays off with interest in son of a gun. Where did that come from? Right. Awesome, awesome stuff. Five more minutes. I was going to quit on this one. I'm going to tell you one more. Can I tell you one more? Yes. All right, that was loud enough. There's a couple of you going, shut up, girl. <laughs> we uh, was living uh, up, up in Mason, Texas, renting a place for $350 a month. And... Uh, there was a guy in our town that needed a work truck. I mean, he had a lot of work to do, and his truck broke down. He didn't have any money to get it. We had a work truck. We'd only paid $1,200 or something for it. That was easy. It was like, we, we got to give this guy our truck. So we gave it to him. That was easy. Well, then, just a little bit after that, God will put you through seasons to see if you'll let go of things. Pay attention to these seasons. There'll be a season to where you think, dear God, are you going to let me keep anything? And, uh, and so there was this other family that had two big old boys. It was like football player boys, big guys. And, and they hauled horses to the racetrack. And all they had was a single cab truck. So it was a dad that was big, two huge boys that were big, and a mama. And they all crammed. They looked like marshmallows crammed into that cab of that truck, hauling those horses to the racetrack. And we had one of those old Dodge, you know, those old first Dodges that had the four-door yeah, we only paid 4000 for it, but that was our good truck. And God started dealing with us. They need that truck. And we had to pray about that one for a while because all we had after that was an Eagle bus that we went on the road with. And uh, so in short, make it short, we, we gave that truck away and watched them drive off, and it felt good. So we, uh, we got in the Eagle bus and headed for East Texas to do some rodeos and stuff. And God started dealing with, get this, I'm not lying. God started dealing with us to give that Eagle bus to this uh, young upcoming singer entertainer that was really on the road a lot. And we're like, uh, God, uh, we're afoot, you know, if we do this. And But we knew we were hearing from God. Both of us was hearing it. We wasn't trying to, you can try to manipulate God. 
I had a couch one time and I didn't like. I got it at a thrift store. It smelled like cat pee. I did not like that couch. And I gave it away to somebody that was worse off than me to try to manipulate God to get me some better furniture. And I sat on lawn chairs and upside down five gallon buckets for a while. You can't manipulate God with your giving. Right? He knows. Anyway, we dealt with it and we gave, we all went to eat someplace in Mexican restaurant. Ray handed the keys across the table to this young guy and said, if you don't mind, we're giving you the truck of the bus travel in. But if you don't mind, let us at least drive it home first <laughs> and come and get it. So we drove that home and didn't know what in the world we was going to do. Well, while I was at that rodeo and singing, everybody thinks thought, I, you know, I did a lot and they, they just figured you're a contract act. You're getting paid. Well, they didn't know I wasn't getting paid. I wouldn't get paid anything. A woman came up to me after I got done singing from the pre-rodeo deal on my horse. She came up to me and she visited with me just a little bit. And she handed me a, a folded up check and shook my hand and said, Lord bless you. And I stuck it in my pocket and went on. Forgot I even had it. Went and got, took care of my horse and everything else. And there was a, a Jeep that a rancher owned at Mason. And I had part of the money but i needed four thousand dollars more to be able to buy this jeep and we're going to get home and we ain't we're going to be afoot and later on i looked at that check guess how much it was how did y'all guess that y'all are so smart four thousand dollars i do not know who that woman was but she heard from god now this ain't the end of the story i get home and i can buy that jeep and we can run around and I'm still, though, I'm a little disappointed because I just thought I'm looking, I'm going, wow, this is awesome. Somebody's going to show up and go, we need to give you a truck so that you can get out on the road, hook your trailer up to that and all that. And nobody did. And all of a sudden we got a call at a bank in town that we didn't even have a checking account at this bank. And they said, do you know this ranch, the 180 ranch, it's called the 180, it was 180 acres, had two lit arenas it had a cutting horse pipe arena lit and it had a roping arena lit and it had a 10 stall horse barn and it had a little bitty old house and and a, and, and guest house with little like bedroom bathroom type things in it and 180 acres great fence cross fence good pasture all of that yeah we know what that is well it'd been for sale forever nobody would ever want to buy it he hadn't bought it it was too expensive he built it up too much and uh he said uh Look, if if uh, if we give if you could you give this guy a we call that give him a no, not an IOU, <laughs> uh, a tax write off thing. Yeah, yeah, he's given in to a charity. Give him a tax write off for us. We'll give you a loan for one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars for this hundred and eighty acre ranch with all of this stuff. They had it for sale for five hundred thousand, half a million. OK, if it, we'll give you a loan for one hundred thirty five thousand, uh, no money down if you'll give him a tax write off. Well, mama didn't raise a fool. And I'm telling you, so next thing you know, we're living on one hundred and eighty acres with all of this stuff. I'm telling you, you don't know how, what or when and you can't figure out God. But I'm telling you, God don't ask for your tithe because he's tight fisted. He asked for your tithe. Because he gave his tithe to win you. And that tithe is holy. And you put it in the right hands of a holy God. And he can make everything else that you touch and have. Don't mean you win all the time. Don't mean you never buck off. Don't mean you don't go through some low spots. But I tell you what it does mean. It means that anytime I get into a, a pickle or, you know, a where where life is redlining and the pucker factor is ding 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 you know up there that you call on God because the Bible says the tither can come to him and say all right Lord I need some covering here I don't know what to do I don't know where to come from but it's got to come if there's ever a day remember I said at the very beginning if I could tell you that there's two things that if you will do God will hover over you during this world of craziness number one you make sure that that you're that God gets the first, the first tenth of, of all of your increase. 
of all your increase, you figure out the 10th part of that and you give that to him first. You keep you keep the tab straight with you and other people. Stay honest. Stay integrable. you got to be honorable with people if God's going to be honorable with you. I know a lot of people that go to church and they might plunk that money in the tithe that they'll cheat somebody out there. And that is not going to ever get by with God. It's not going to work. So you be honorable and then keep your mouth from from damning God over what's happening and and all. And well, this world is falling apart like a two dollar. I don't know what God is doing, but he ain't doing what I think he should be. Shut it up. Shut it up. You don't know. You don't know what God is doing because he ain't doing it out in the open. He's doing it in the background. He's doing it inside people. He's doing it in in the quiet places. He's building traps and the devil's going to walk right in it. So this is the thing. You get this stuff straight. And I'm telling you what, you'll have a walk with God that is going to cover you in these days ahead. If there's ever a time to where I want to be covered financially, health wise and everything else, it's now. When all when that virus and stuff, all that pandemic that they put on us and all of that, walk through that thing without uh, without a burp. Why? Because I'm a tither, bless God, and 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 God covers me, and I didn't get afraid. I wasn't wringing my hands or anything like that. Why? Because I know I'm covered, man. I know I'm covered. Amen. Okay, I'm closing out on this, but let's stand to our feet and let's do this. Some of you here. You may have been thinking that you were tithing, but you've been tipping God. God is not your waiter. You don't tip God. He's not your waiter. He's the king of glory, and he tithed. He gave his firstborn, firstborn who was clean, that Jesus had to be sacrificed because you and I are what? Were unclean. We had to be redeemed. And God gave his first to save us. You honor if he's really your God, if he's really your God and he's not just some religious mindset. If he's really your God, you give him the first because he's God. And every time I pray over our tithes, because I tithe in a lot of ministries, I get more than the tenth. I'm taking it to the Lord and I say, Lord, I honor you with this money. I give this to you. I'm so great and I may need it. God, I'm so grateful to give this to you because I'm in covenant with you. And you're never going to throw me in the deep end and let me drown. You're going to cover me no matter what. And he always does. Bow your heads. For those in here and those maybe watching online, you check yourself. You know whether or not you've been doing this right or not. I'm not going to call for an altar call. I'm going to say this. If you are not right with God, in your finances, get right now. Now you can't go back and catch up on all the money you owe him. He don't he, he don't need your money. He ain't after your money. What you can do is repent and get right with God in your heart. That's what he's after. He's after your heart. And you talk to the Lord and say, Lord, from this day forward, I want to stand in right relationship with you. I want to be under the windows of heaven to keep me protected. This world could go through a drought. This world, they could cut out all the diesel to where they can't run food to the stores, but you'll feed us, God, because I'm a tither.